Welcome to the second session of the Haas Symposium. My name is Zasha Nolden, and I'm addressing you from sunny Wellington, where I am a research librarian at the Alexander Turnbull Library. It is my privilege to introduce the first speaker of this session, Julia Bradshaw, addressing us from Christchurch. Welcome back, Julia. Julia is Senior Curator, Human History at Canterbury Museum, and has worked in museums for about 27 years. She has a background in South Island history and has a special interest in New Zealand's gold rushes, Chinese, women, and remote places. And she has had five books published on these topics. She is fascinated by accounts of exploration, isolation, and hardship, and is currently researching the lives of women during the gold rush. Julia says, I have had an interest in South Westland since I worked as a guide on the Holliford Tract in the 1990s and I'm very familiar with the trials of traveling in areas with high rainfall and lots of biting insects. I am fascinated by the journeys made by Māori and Pākehā in South Westland and the different styles of travel. Today, Julia will be sharing some of the results of her research into the history and exploration of the Haast Pass. Please welcome Julia Bradshaw. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. That's lovely. Kura Koto and Guten Tag. One of the many lasting legacies of geologist Julius von Haast is the pass and river in southern New Zealand, which were named by him. Haast Pass is at the lowest pass in the Southern Alps, and the 100 kilometre long Haast River, previously the Awarua, drains westward of the path, pass to the Tasman Sea. Nowadays, the pass is straddled by a road, which travels from Lake Wanaka, through the village of Makavarua, over the pass, and down the Haast River to the sea, where there is a small township, also known as Haast. Haast located the pass in 1863, when, he's can when he was Canterbury's provincial geologist. As was typical of the time, Haast saw the South Island backcountry as an empty wilderness, without history or people. When writing of his proposed journey, he stated that, Never anybody has been in that part of the country. His words are an example of Pākehā blindness to Indigenous occupation and knowledge. While the country that Haast was travelling in was lightly populated at the time, it had a long history of human occupation and was a landscape filled with names and stories. Generations of Māori had been using passes in the Southern Alps to travel and trade. The pass between Lake Wanaka and the Awarua Valley was known as Te Ora Pātia, the way ahead is clear. Haast was also understating Pākehā knowledge. That there was a track from North Otago to the west was not unknown. In 1844, Te Horuhuru, who had lived near Lake Wanaka, drew a map for Edward Shortland, who published it in 1851. This map showed a route from Lake Wallanaka to Awarua that took two days to travel. While the coastline of the South Island had been charted by Admiral Stokes on the Acheron in the early 1850s, only the sketchiest maps of the interior were available. And it was easy to be confused, especially when faced with rows of mountains. A map of Otago published in 1858 showed a pass from Lake Wanaka to the west, but erroneously showed the Makarora River on the western side of Lake Wanaka and the route going across the mountains to a bay further south. It was probably this map which misled Canterbury surveyor Edward Jolly and his cadet William Young, who searched for the pass in 1859 but did not find it. John Holland Baker, later Surveyor General of New Zealand, is supposed to have found the pass in 1861, but didn't think to tell anyone of it, leaving Charles Cameron and Haas to argue over who was the first two years later. Mapping of the interior didn't proceed with any great urgency until the discovery of gold at Gabriel's Gully in Otago, 1861. This momentous discovery was followed by finds of more gold further inland. Naturally, there was interest in exploring further west in the hope of finding even more. From mid-1862, adventurous men began looking for passes to the west coast, 
including Scotland's born Charles Cameron, who had arrived in New Zealand in 1840 as a 20-year-old. He became an experienced backcountry traveller and in 1847 was the first person to take a large mob of sheep and cattle from Wellington to Whanganui. And during the late 1850s, he was exploring in Western Australia, but came back to New Zealand when gold was discovered in Otago. He was a tall, lean man who George Hassing, ferryman at the Clutha River, described as an impetuous explorer. Cameron had found a pass at the head of the Matukituki River, that's the river on the west side of Lake Wanaka, in October 1862, and having received further information from Māori, planned another visit to Wanaka, this time to explore the Makarora River. In 1863, he was 42 years old and recently married. Cameron wrote to the superintendent of Canterbury to tell him that he knew of a route to the west coast near the southern border of Canterbury and was starting for it soon. Perhaps, he asked, Canterbury would consider offering him some financial assistance. Cameron's letter was received on the 20th of November 1862. Rather than giving any assistance, the superintendent responded by saying that their geologist, Julius Haast, was about to start on an expedition to explore the area. Haast had already been planning to find the pass from Makarora to the west coast. Two months earlier, he had written, This year I shall be in time in the very heart of the Alps, travelling from Lake Wanaka to the mouth of the Aorua. Haast's specific information about the pass almost certainly came from William Young, who had tried to find the pass in 1859 with Jolly and who was subsequently a member of Haast's Mount Cook party in early 1862. Haast plans may have received added urgency after Cameron's letter and Haast left Christchurch for the South shortly afterwards, stopping en route to get additional information from Māori. Cameron reached Makarora first having travelled with his horse and dog and minimal equipment from the outlet of Lake Wanaka around the side of, the la of Lake Hawea and then up to Makarora. Cameron's own account of his journey, written on the 11th of February, when Haast and party were still battling down the Haast River, has recently been located on papers past. This provides some details of where he went, but is lacking in detail, partly due to the difficulty of describing locations in unmapped territory. Cameron reported that he sent a rough sketch of his route to the superintendent of Canterbury, but this has not been located. Cameron reported that he went up the Makarora River for about 40 kilometres, and this would take him close to the pass, but then returned eight kilometres and left his horse and gun as what is now known as Cameron's Flat. While Cameron may have reached Te Ora Patia, now known as Haas Pass, it is odd that he doesn't mention it. It seems that Cameron was following the trail up the Blue River, which is probably the one that Māori had told him about. This trail is recorded as having been used by Māori in preference to the long and difficult trip down the Aorua River. Leaving the flat, Cameron took with him two weeks supplies and followed the Maori Trail up the Blue River, clearing the forest in about five hours and then crossing Maori Saddle. He recalled, the mountains here are high and steep and partly covered to a great depth with snow, traveling both dangerous and difficult. Continuing westwards, Cameron says that he first caught sight of the sea on the 24th of January, 1863 and later reached the coastline between Arurua and the Okuru River further south. However, his descriptions do not bear this out. He said that the mountains ended directly into the sea and that it was impossible to get along the coastline. Both of these statements are untrue, but it might look that way if you were view viewing the coastline from the mountaintops further back. Cameron gives little information about how he returned to Makarora Valley. A clue is provided by surveyor Noel Broderick's discovery in 1881 of a powder flask with the words Charles Cameron, January 1863, scratched on it. In the centre of a cairn on the top of a snow-covered peak to the west of the pass, from this mountain, 
you cannot fail to see the pass. On 29th of January, 1863, Cameron returned to Cameron Flat and was and surprised three of Hast's men who had returned to collect a tent. According to one of the men, Cameron stated with the greatest coolness that he had just returned from the West Coast, describing his route as lying along the tops of the mountains, rough and perilous in the extreme, and to follow which again, he would not take a thousand pounds. That's about $130,000 in today's money. Another of Haas' men later described Cameron as pumping them for information about the pass, which supports the idea that Cameron had not actually reached or crossed it, despite seeing it from above. Cameron's journey had taken him about three weeks, and if he had travelled for this entire time, and there is no reason to doubt this, then his trip was a remarkable alpine journey. When Haas started his journey two weeks after Cameron, he was 41 years old, two years younger than Cameron, but much less experienced in New Zealand's backcountry. His companions were the previously mentioned surveyor, 21-year-old William Young, as topographer, Haas' good friend, 30-year-old Robert Holmes, 28-year-old William Warner, a mariner, as chainman, and Charles Haring, another mariner, also known as Charlie Williams, about whom no further details are known. We are fortunate with accounts of Haast and Party's journey. Haast wrote about it in his spiky hand for a paper which he never gave and which Heinrich von Haast based his account of the journey on. Robert Holmes wrote to his sister in Ballarat, Australia, and William Warner kept a laconic journal, mostly commenting on the weather and campsites, while William Young made a series of sketches. The party had a very different style of travel to Cameron's. While Haas' party had a dog, too, they also had tents, blankets, clothes, cooking utensils, survey equipment, mining implements, and a month's provisions. The provisions included 90 kilograms of flour, as well as bacon, sugar, coffee, salt, and brandy. This was a lot to transport, and each man carried from 27 to 32 kilograms on their backs, constantly returning for a second load of the same weight. Caches of food were left along the route. For example, at the head of the Makaroa River, they left 13 kilograms of flour, 2.2 kilograms of bacon, and 2.2 kilograms of sugar. The party travelled by boat to the head of Lake Wanaka, and then Haas Party, like Cameron, camped at the small Sormaling settlement, now the village of Makarora. They started on the expedition on 22nd of January 1863 and reached the gorges in the upper Makarora and Fish River that night. These gorges present significant obstacles, which are not apparent when you glide past on today's modern highway. After some difficulty negotiating them, and with several men returning to bring more supplies, the group reached Tiora Patia on 24th of January. Here the group halted, gave three cheers, and had a drink of brandy. William Young sketched the scene of the party's first sight of the pass. Writing later to William Warner, he said, This will remind you of the first discovery of Haast Pass. You can see the doctor's excitement when I made a sketch from the treetop as he exclaimed, well, this must be one of the most remarkable passes in the world. Haas described finding such a low pass in a chain of such magnitude as the Southern Alps as remarkable and probably without parallel in the known world. Later, Haas would describe how he forged ahead while his men returned for more provisions and commented that, only those who have been on similar exploring expeditions can understand what delight it is to go on by yourself in a country when perhaps never before the foot of man has trodden. Again, ignoring the fact that Maori had given him directions to the pass. The next day, Haston Young climbed Mount Brewster, collecting plant specimens as they went. They obtained a good view, 
possibly similar to this one, and could see that the route down the Awarua was not going to be easy. This was probably the most enjoyable part of the trip. In just three days since leaving Makaurora, they had found the pass and had views towards the west coast. But the good times didn't last. On 26th of January, it began to rain, and it will continue to rain for the next two weeks. During that fortnight, the party was only able to travel seven kilometres to the junction of the Burke and the Haast rivers, which they reached on the 12th of February, by which time Cameron had written up his report. Getting past the rough country around what is now called the Gates of Haast was described by Holmes as some of the roughest work I ever experienced, carrying our heavy loads up and down mountains and precipices. By now, Haas party were running short of provisions and flour was rationed to 2.7 kilograms per day for the whole party, supplemented by whatever birds or eels they could catch. On the 14th, the party crossed the Awarua River above the Burke and were now committed to staying on the north side of the river as it was too large to cross. And this slide shows their, their path. I've highlighted it in red. Fortunately, the weather improved and the men had high hopes of reaching the sea soon. But the Awarua is a long valley and after five more days and 45 kilometres, they were still five kilometres from the sea. But at least they were in flat country. Young wrote to Warner with this sketch. This image shows the doctor geologising me taking a sketch, and yourself, Holmes and Charlie, congratulating yourselves that we were finally getting out of the everlasting mountains. Starting early on the 20th of February, the men left their camp, taking just blankets and provisions with them. Before leaving, Warner wrote in his journal, beautiful weather, pray to God it may remain so until we come back or we shall all be starved. The party reached the coastline at two o'clock on 20th of February, 30 days after leaving Makarora. None of the surviving accounts say much about the significant milestone, so perhaps it was a bit of an anticlimax. Holmes recorded that they had hoped to find a Maori village to get food from, but were disappointed. The coastal village of Okaho being 40 kilometres further south. Haas sketched a panorama of the view, part of which is shown here, showing the landscape north and south. The journey back up the Awarua was a much faster affair. Haast and party were able to follow the tracks they had already made and had mostly good weather, and they got back to Makarora in just 10 days. Altogether, they had been travelling for six weeks. While Cameron and Haast had been travelling beyond the head, of the head of Lake Wanaka, others had also been searching for a pass to the west coast. On 16th of February, 1863, Samuel Sims and William Sutcliffe reported they had found a pass to the west coast from near the Shotover River. Cameron's journey was reported a few days afterwards, and following that, an expedition led by Dr Hector reported that they had reached the Matukituki saddle, which actually Cameron had already reached the previous October and that they had travelled towards the west coast for another seven days, before a lack of food meant they had to return only a few kilometres from the coastline. Unaware of all this activity, Haast and Young continued surveying and exploring. Finally, on 3rd of March at Makarora, Haast sat down and wrote his report to Canterbury Superintendent, and this was published in newspapers in early 1863. Haas reported that he had given his name to the pass as directed by Canterbury Superintendent, but no evidence of these instructions have been found. Although the Awarua River had been appearing on maps since the early 1850s, and despite knowing its Māori name, Haas also renamed the Awarua River as Haas River. Haas' news coincided with the return of surveyor J.C. Drake, who had been surveying northern routes to the west coast, and also with Hector's return to Dunedin from the Matukituki. Rather unkindly, the Otago newspapers described Hector's journey as more thrilling than Haas', but were disapp was disappointed with both of them for not finding a goldfield. 
Cameron and Haas' competing claims to have discovered a pass at the head of Mac the Makarora were aired in letters to the newspapers. On October 1863, Cameron stated that he had discovered the northern route through Canterbury, being in advance of Dr. Haast. Alluding also to Hector's journey, Cameron complained that no credit was conceded to private explorers in connection with the discovery of these routes. Those employed by provincial governments to find new country needed to secure their careers, and they were not generous in recognising competitors. Haast was very fortunate with the timing of his expedition. If Haast hadn't located the pass in early 1863, then others would have. Cameron, who had at least, see, at least seen it from above, would certainly have told people of its existence. Gold miners trying to get to the new rushes on the west coast would have found it, as would have surveyors from Otago eventually. In 18, July 1863, Browning published the latest map of Canterbury, and this is the, included all of the work by Haast and other surveyors. Not only did the map include Haast Pass and Haast River, but it also showed Haast Range, which had been named by Hector. The discovery of a payable goldfield on the west coast a year later meant that rather than fall into obscurity, Haast Pass, which was fortunately a very low altitude, provided a cheaper, though potentially a much more dangerous and uncomfortable, way for Otago diggers to get to the new gold fields on the west coast. Their only other option being to go by sea from Dunedin or Invercargill. Vincent Pike, Secretary of Otago's Gold Fields Department, was sent to mark out a track in 1865 and described Haas's route down the north side of the river as impractical for any useful purpose. In 1875, Pike's track along the south side of the Haas River was upgraded to a horse track, and during the Depression, men worked on turning this into a road, which opened in 1960. Today, it is a very scenic journey along a sealed road, and you can get from Makarora to Haast Village in about an hour. Cameron and Haast made two very different journeys, with Haast being much more significant from almost every point of view, but particularly from the perspective of science and mapping. Haast and his party have the distinction of being the first European party to travel down the entire length of the Aorua River. It was a difficult journey, hampered by poor weather and the large amount of gear that they carried. This, together with the need to take survey measurements and collect specimens, meant that the expedition proceeded at a reasonably leisurely pace. Even on their way back from the Aorua River to Makarora, the party only averaged nine kilometres a day. They returned with surveyors' measurements of the country, sketches, plant specimens, some rock samples, and Haas's first kiwi skin. In contrast, Cameron's journey was lightweight and fast, and he was fortunate with the weather. If Cameron did get to win the site of the Tasman Sea along the mountaintops, his journey was quite a feat and worthy of recognition. However, his lack of observations and scientific information meant that it was easy for Haast and others to belittle his trip and inflate the importance of their own journeys. Although it is still to be established exactly how far Cameron got, he has the distinction of being one of the first Europeans to make an extended alpine journey in the southern mountains. Credit goes to those who make the most noise and to those who are in a position to make sure that they get recognised. Haast was very quick to get his name on maps, and this was due to his ambition and his need for the recognition that would improve his professional standing and secure his career. As I've alluded to earlier, um, one of Haast's lasting legacies is the displacement of Māori names. At the time, this was not unusual, but some surveyors and explorers did make an effort to find out the original names. Due to Haast's need to impress, he was reluctant to acknowledge Māori. He asked Māori for information about the route, but would not return to ask for names. Indeed, he knew before the trip that the name of what he called Haast River was Awarua. Haas new names effectively covered up centuries of accumulated observations and stories connected to the landscape. 
This is frustrating as these earlier names can help people understand the history and stories of the area much more than newer names given to curry favour with the great and influential. Some examples of Haas names are Mount Hooker, which was previously Rakai, which means to stand up threateningly. Mount Brewster, which Haas named after Scotsman Sir David Brewster, which was previously known as Haumai Tiki Tiki, the wind blowing from the heights. And the Young Range, which had been known as Tifarimanu, the house of birds. Thankfully, the Grey Range, which Haas had named for New Zealand's Governor General Sir George Grey, did not stick and a version of its earlier name has survived as the Matukituki Range. And I do not want to, um, I'm not meaning to dishast or um, say that his journey wasn't very significant, but it was significant from the po point of uh, Pākehā knowledge of the country's landscape, flora and fauna, but it is a mistake to say that Haas discovered Haas Pass. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. What a fascinating journey you've taken us on. I'm absolutely impressed with what you've been able to discover and present so vividly today. I recall when we first looked at the Haas lecture notes um, on the Haas Pass, and this manuscript was some 50 pages of hurried notes written on the reverse side of pages from another manuscript seemed almost illegible. I recall how you mentioned the process of carefully reading your way into this handwriting. I'm also thrilled to see how you've managed to use Wilhelm Fiana's diary narratives. It's just so vividly wonderful and immediate. It's just great to see the research value of these archival primary source documents in the Haast collection and other collections being so fully utilized and placed in context through your work. Thank you so much. 